stand up with us and go ahead and roll it in? Well, let's praise the Lord together as we sing. This is amazing grace.
my soul.
I would be happy. If I made more money, I would be happy. If we had fewer bills, I would be happy. And a young mother thinks, if I can ever get to the point that I get all of my children beyond the toddler stage and get them in school, then I'll be happy. Well, here's the facts. All of us in this room, in one way or another, we're pursuing happiness and joy. Right? All of us here, we are pursuing happiness and joy. This is one of the ultimate goals of every human. Thomas Jefferson, our third president, famously called the pursuit of happiness as an inalienable right given to us by our Creator. God gave us a right to pursue happiness. And in desiring peace and joy and happiness, that's not wrong. It's not wrong at all. But how we pursue those things is very important. And that's the focus of my message here this morning. First of all, my right to happiness cannot deprive you, you from your right to happiness. The real problem is, the real problem is that people search for happiness in the wrong places. And whenever we do, we come up empty. If we don't pursue happiness God's way, because who invented happiness? God did. God did. Whenever we look for happiness in the wrong way or in the wrong places, we come up empty. But happiness is not as elusive as people might think. But we have to start with the right perspective. Which leads me to my first point today, if you're following with me in your notes. True happiness cannot be found in anything unless it is first found in God. That's where it begins. True happiness, if you are looking for true happiness today, you have to begin with God, the creator of life and the creator of happiness. Family cannot be our source of happiness. Fame cannot be our source of happiness. Financial security cannot be our source of happiness. Possessions and power will not meet all of our needs. True happiness cannot be found in anything unless it is first found in God. God wants you to be happy. God wants me to be happy. Say that with me. God wants me to be happy. Do you believe that? I'm not sure you do. <laughs> Say that with me again. God wants me to be happy. So remember that. God wants you to be happy. But joy first has to be found in Him. And when joy is found there you will begin finding joy in other areas of your life. So when you find joy in God, you begin finding joy in other areas of your life. Jesus made it very clear in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, that this is the formula. In Matthew 6, verse 33, the Bible says, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. So a process. Seek God, seek joy in Him first, and all these things will be added to you. Well, today, I want us to do a little bit of an experiment. I've never done this before, but if you are turning your Bibles, you can turn them now to Matthew chapter 5. I'm going to be reading out of a very unusual translation, and we're going to be going very, very slowly. 
And I want you to know that the Amplified Version of the Bible, it's not really a translation. It's really more of a commentary. It's more of a compact commentary. And if you're following along with me in your Bible, you're going to see uh, it worded very similar to your words, except the commentary part is going to be in parentheses. So we're going to look at verses 1 and 2 first, and then we're going to stop when we get to verse 3. Now remember, this is Jesus' most famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. The Bible says, when Jesus saw the crowds, he went on the mountain, went up on the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him, and then he began to teach them, saying, and then, beginning in verse 3, move on to verse 3, please. I want you to notice that in verse number 3, if you see everything in the dark red, that's the words of Jesus that will be somewhat in your Bible. But what's in parentheses here explain what the words mean. So, in verse number 3, the first beatitude... It says, blessed are the poor in spirit. So, who are the poor in spirit? It's the people, if you are poor in your spirit, it means that you're not full of yourself. So think of this. Blessed are those who are not full of themselves. They're poor in their own spirit so that they can be filled with the spirit of God. And so, notice the definition of blessed. Blessed meaning spiritually prosperous, or happy, or to be admired by others. So when you are not full of yourselves, whenever you are full of God, you will be happy yourself, and you will be a person to be admired because you're poor in spirit. You're devoid of spiritual arrogance. You are uh, uh, those who regard, you regard yourself as insignificant in the huge scheme of things because you are always pointing to God as your answer. The Bible says theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, let's look at the next beatitude in verse number four. It says blessed. And in this case, the word blessed means forgiven or refreshed by God. Have you ever had a literally spectacular, well, I really, uh, I showed my southern accent, didn't I? Uh, a really spectacular, have you ever experienced something in worship that was so amazing that you felt refreshed by it? Whenever we know we are forgiven. Whenever we know we are right between us and God, that's a reason to be happy. That's a reason to be blessed. But there it says, blessed are those who mourn. Mourn over what? They mourn over their sins and repent. Now remember the word repent not only means I confess my sins, it means I'm turning away from them. I'm walking God's way now. So blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And whenever we're comforted, it means we are refreshed by God's grace when the burden of sin is lifted. Or what about the third beatitude in verse 5? It says, blessed, or you're inwardly peaceful. You feel spiritually secure. You feel worthy of respect. Blessed are the gentle. Now, in the King James Version there, the word gentle, it says meek. And if you want to know the true definition of meekness, do you remember whenever Jesus said, if somebody slaps you on the cheek, what do you do? Turn the next cheek. Now, it doesn't say turn the next cheek and run away. It means turn the next cheek and stand there. Now, the word meek, it means a sense of self-control. I want to tell you something. 
if one of you came up to me after the service and you reared back and as hard as you could, you slapped me on the right cheek, it's going to take a lot of self-control for me to go, here you go, right there. It's going to take a lot of self-control. But yet the Bible says, blessed are the gentle, or blessed are the meek, who have such self-control, they're kind-hearted, they're sweet-spirited, that type of person will inherit the earth. Whenever the world around them crumbles, that person will still be standing. Wow! I find those words powerful. But look at verse number 6. Blessed, meaning joyful or nourished by God's goodness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. Whenever we're hunger, whenever we hunger and thirst after righteousness, we are actively seeking to have perfect standing with God. And the Bible says, Jesus said, they will be satisfied. And then number seven, blessed or now contented. You're content because you feel sheltered by God's promises. Blessed are the merciful. Who are the merciful? Those who are willing to forgive. Blessed are the merciful. They will receive mercy. If you don't receive mercy from anybody else here on earth, if you are merciful to others, you will receive God's mercy. And you can take that to the bank and you can rest in that. <coughs> or verse number 8. Blessed. And we're blessed to the point that we anticipate God's presence. We're blessed to the point that we now feel that there is a spiritual maturity. Blessed are the pure in heart. You see how we have progressed in our walk with Christ? Because we have a pure heart, we live with integrity. Because we have a pure heart, we exhibit moral courage and godly character. Whenever we are pure in heart, we will not only re we will not only see God at the end of our lives, but ladies and gentlemen, we will see God active, moving in our lives here on earth. We will see glimpses of God all around us. And then the next verse, verse number nine. Blessed, or those who are spiritually calmed with life, joy, and God's favor. You know, one of the greatest feelings in life is to feel calm. Right? It's to feel that peace and calm. And blessed are the makers and maintainers of peace. Why? Because we express God's character. And because of that, we will be called the children of God. And, and then number 10, blessed, again, comforted by inner peace and God's love. Blessed are those who are persecuted for doing that which is moral, morally right. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven, both now and forevermore. And then finally, blessed or morally courageous and spiritually alive with life, joy, and God's goodness. Blessed are you when people insult you. Blessed are you when people persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you. Why? Because of your association with me. And then it goes on in verse 12 and it says, Be glad and exceedingly joyful, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Ladies and gentlemen, God created happiness. He wants us to feel blessed. He wants us to feel happy. Why, even at the birth of Jesus, 
the story that we read in Luke chapter 2 every uh, Christmas time? Sometimes by the time we get to verse number 10, we're ready to hurry up and get the rest of it over with. But there is a powerful statement in verse number 10. Remember whenever the angel appeared before the shepherds? They were out keeping watch over their flocks by night, but Jesus had been born in Bethlehem. And so the angel showed up in the heavens. The bright light came down uh, representing the glory of God, the glory from heaven. And the Bible says that as a result of this, they were very afraid. The King James Version says they were sore afraid. I used to wonder if that meant that they were so afraid they were sore. But, uh, but whenever I was a little kid, that's what I thought it meant. But, but anyway, the angel said to the shepherds, I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. Okay, it's test time. The angel brought good what? Good news. The good news brought what? Great joy. Great joy from Jesus. The great joy is for who? All people. So, good news, great joy for all people. You know what that means, don't you? It means that Jesus and joy are a package deal. Jesus and joy are a package deal. There is no reason for a Christian to go around all soured up and moody all the time. Jesus and joy are always a package deal. Good news is the definition of the gospel. The very word gospel means good news. In Luke 10, the word translated good news, it comes from the Greek word evangelon where we get our English word evangelist or evangelism. So, get this, an evangelist is someone who shares good news. Why, well, we thought it was some preacher. An evangelist is someone who shares good news. Some people can't seem to understand how God and happiness go together. Many people see God's commands only as a list of don'ts. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not covet. And so as a result, the Bible is full of positive statements. But for some reason or another, many people see God's commands as a list of notes. It's like we live in the negative now in hopes of something positive once we get to heaven. Why? Wasn't the good news delivered here on earth? Haven't we been given good news that brings great joy and it's for all people so none of you here today are left out? Well, maybe it's the preacher's fault. I, I mean, after all, we preachers, whenever we get up here and deliver a sermon, we got to balance the good news and the bad news, you know? Well, then we start preaching we act and we kind of wax eloquently about the goriness of sin and the sneakiness of the devil. And sometimes we run out of time before we get to the great news, the good news that brings great joy. What if I begin my message each week? What if I begin my message each week by saying, okay, Folks, I got good news and I got bad news. What do you want first? Mm. Look at this slide. It's like the woman that went to her husband and she says, I've got good news and bad news. The husband says, I'm very busy.
busy. What's the good news? And the wife said, the airbags in our new BMW work really well. <laughs> You know, too many people think that religion and fun are fundamentally opposed to one another. But nothing could be further from the truth. God invented happiness. God came up with the concept of humor. God created our ability to have fun. God created us with five senses to enjoy. We're able to think. We're able to smell a good meal cooking, or, or, or for me, if uh, uh, we were out the other night, and uh, we were in town, and I took a whiff of the evening air, and close by, somebody had some logs in the fireplace or the wood stove. I love that smell. We have senses. We're able to hear and see. We're able to touch and feel. We were created with these senses to enjoy. The Bible is full of words like joy, rejoice, blessing, happiness, peace. And happiness is the natural result of knowing God and experiencing His love. In Isaiah 52.7, the Bible says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger who brings good news of peace and salvation. The good news that God reigns. Good news that God is still in control. Good news that God is watching over us. You know, people with good news carry that good news to other people who need it. So messengers with good news, the Bible says, has beautiful feet. How beautiful are the feet of those who deliver the good news. Which brings me to the last point I want to share with you today. If you say that you live the gospel, but there is no joy, I'd say there's a problem with your gospel. If you say you live the gospel but there's no joy, I'd say there's a problem with your gospel. The gospel is good news for everyone. It's not just good news for those who are already good. It's not just for those Christians who are self-controlled and disciplined and they already have all their ducks in a row. The good news is even for people who can't find their ducks. So I'm going to make a bold statement before I close. I'd like for you to think about this. And until you think about it, you're going to think this statement is crazy. But there's some truth to it. Many people are comfortable with bad news. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But it's true. Why are we comfortable with bad news? It's because that's what we're used to getting. It's because that's what we are used to receiving, bad news. And whenever bad is the norm, we expect the bad. But the good news of the gospel gives us hope, and we can experience that hope today. So what kind of news have you been listening to? You see, one of the greatest indictments of Christians today is their lack of joy. Something is wrong. Something's wrong in us whenever we practically have a stroke just trying to crack a smile. I love the book of Nehemiah. It's probably my favorite Old Testament book. They had completed the wall. That was their assignment. Put a wall around Jerusalem for protection. They hadn't quite gotten all the gates put in yet. But the wall was completed. Their work was almost over. 
And somewhere in the middle of all of this, with all of the threats of the enemy nearby, something happened that caused a sense of uneasiness around everybody. Now, they had already worked 80% of the way, 90% of the way to victory. Almost there. Almost to the finish line. But Nehemiah had to give them some encouragement in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 10. Here's what he said to them. Don't be dejected and sad, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Don't be dejected. Don't be sad. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy that comes from the Lord, that's our strength. Some of us here today are weary. Some of us are tired of the same old, same old. Some of us are tired of that same old pain. Some of us are tired of that same old worry. Are you overworked? Are you experiencing a lack of sleep? Do you have a lack of joy? The Bible says the joy of the Lord is our strength. In the 51st Psalm, David prayed a prayer. Fill in the blank. Lord, restore unto me the joy of blank salvation. Lord, restore unto me the joy of salvation originated with God. So, Lord, restore unto me those things that you have given me always, things related to your salvation. Lord, your joy comes from your things. The salvation is not ours. It is God's provided. The sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, it was Jesus' sacrifice, not yours. But his sacrifice was provided for you. We may possess it, but it's his. Because you are his. The Bible says you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. So therefore... Glorify God with your body, with your life. These things are His. Father God, for anyone who is struggling today, lead us to a new path of happiness. And that happiness is through discovering your joy. Celebrating your salvation given to us. Help us, dear Jesus. Help us, dear Jesus, to leave here with a sense of peace, knowing just how much you love us. And may that peace give us the happiness we need. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Would you stand with me as we sing our closing song? If you have a need for prayer today, I'll be standing at the altar. I'd be glad to pray with you. Won't you come?
got some good news before we close, and it's not one of those good news, bad news things. It's just good news. Uh, uh, we shared with you that uh, we were blessed after those who took the CPR class for the weekend. Somebody donated, uh, somebody outside of our church donated us an AED machine. And so, uh, and we have uh, at least 18 of us that have uh, been through CPR training. And so we hope and pray that it never happens. But uh, I'll just tell you, in case you know of somebody who needs it, it is in the hallway. You can see it there. And, uh, and if we ever need it, we've got people who will be able to administer it. And we have, uh, so we've just been blessed. And I just wanted you folks, wanted to announce that. And I wanted to uh, thank the, uh, the giver, uh, Bob, who gave that to us. Okay, Los Bravos uh, Restaurant in, uh, 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 actually, uh, the manager on the east side is a supporter of our ministry in Honduras. So, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Los Bravos Restaurant donated that to us. So, so that uh, that's, uh, folks, those cost twelve to sixteen hundred dollars. So, an incredible, incredible gift to us. I just wanted you to know uh, uh, that, and uh, I know that there are still those who desire to join our church family. Next Sunday, we'll be opening the doors of the church uh, again uh, for those who might want to join. We've already had uh, eight that have joined, and uh, and we're looking forward. Uh, I, I think there's about that many more, and so we're looking forward to that. So thank you for being here today. I'm going to ask Randy Boyer to lead us in the discussion.